Welcome to Exposure Basics from Quick Pro Camera Guides. Photography can be very rewarding and we hope you'll enjoy learning more about it with this DVD. We trust that you'll find it helpful and informative. You may have noticed taking great pictures doesn't always happen automatically. It's important to understand some fundamentals to help you capture great images. No matter what camera you're using, the fundamentals of photography stay the same. This DVD was created to teach you some of the basic principles of photography, which are principles of exposure. Before we get started, let's talk a little bit about the Exposure Tips card that came with your DVD. This card was designed to be a quick reference to keep in your camera bag to help you when you're out taking pictures. It will help you remember the things that we'll be discussing today. Check the back of your card for coupon codes that can be used at quickproguides.com. Exposure is the process of allowing light to fall onto a photosensitive surface like film or a digital camera's image sensor. There are three major elements of exposure. These are aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. Mastering the relationship of these three elements will take your photography to the next level. Let's talk a little about your camera. A camera is a light-proof box designed to capture and record light. Let's first go over how your camera captures light. Most digital cameras are made up of four main parts. These parts are the lens, aperture, shutter, and image sensor. Light passes through the glass in the lens past an aperture. The aperture determines how much light continues through the lens to the shutter. The shutter is the gate that opens and closes for a precise amount of time and determines how long the image sensor will be exposed to light. The image sensor is a chip in the camera that records the light and then transfers that information to your camera's memory card. Today we're at the ice cream shop and we're going to be taking pictures of this ice cream sundae. We'll learn how to use aperture to help bring emphasis to the subject when the background may distract. We'll also learn how to tie the background in with the subject when all of the details are of interest. The aperture is the opening in your lens. It controls the amount of light that passes through the lens to the image sensor. The size of the aperture can be changed from very small to very large. The size of the opening is expressed on your camera as a number, or f-stop. In other words, the aperture is the opening in the lens and the f-stop is the setting on the camera that controls the size of that opening. The smaller f-numbers, like f2.8, give the largest opening. The higher f-stop numbers, like f22, will give you a smaller opening. For example, f2.8 will give you a very large aperture, which in turn allows more light into the camera. Likewise, f22 is a small aperture, which will allow less light into the camera. The camera requires light to pass through the lens to the image sensor to record a photo. It's important that just the right amount of light gets to the image sensor. Too much light or too little light will cause your image to be too bright or too dark and will reduce the quality of your image. Your camera's light meter will help you to know which f-stop, shutter speed, and ISO to use to make sure that you have the correct amount of light entering the camera for every shot. An underexposed image is too dark and you'll lose detail in the shadow areas. When the little arrow on your camera's light meter is to the right of the center point, it's indicating that the image will be underexposed. To fix this, you can adjust the f-stop to a smaller number to increase the amount of light that is allowed into the camera. This will brighten up the image and allow the detail in your shadows to appear. An overexposed image will be too bright and you'll lose detail in the highlights. When the little arrow on your camera's light meter is to the left of the center point, it is indicating that the image will be overexposed. To fix this, you can adjust the f-stop to the larger number to decrease the amount of light that is allowed into the camera. This will darken the image and allow the detail in your highlights to appear. It's important to check the light meter on every shot. By doing this, before you take the photograph, you can save yourself of having to reshoot the photo because of poor exposure. The aperture, or f-stop, also controls what is known as depth of field. Depth of field is the range of your image that is in focus. The smaller the f-stop, the more shallow your range of focus, or depth of field, will become. The point that you focus on will always stay in focus, but the area in front of that point and the area behind that point may be blurry or sharp, depending on your f-stop. 
The higher the f-stop, the more area that stays in focus. The depth of field always begins from the focal point and grows from that point depending on your aperture. These changes are created simply by changing the f-stop. A high f-stop number like f16 or f22 will give you a large depth of field and keep more things in focus. A low f-stop like f2.8 or f4 will give you a shallow depth of field keeping the subject in focus but making the space in front of the subject and behind the subject blurry. Depth of field is also controlled by the size of the scene. The depth of field on a close-up shot of our ice cream will be much shallower than the depth of field on a landscape, even if they're both taken with the same f-stop, because the landscape is a much larger scene. The depth of field is also in proportion to how close the camera is to the subject. If you use a very low f-stop number and you're very close to a subject, you may find that part of the subject is not in focus. For this reason, when photographing close-ups, you may want to use the very lowest f-stop. Digital cameras have two different modes that will allow you to change the f-stop. One is manual mode and the other is aperture priority mode. In manual mode, you'll be responsible for making sure that both the aperture and the shutter speed are balanced to make a properly exposed image. In aperture priority mode, you will only need to choose the aperture and the camera will choose the appropriate shutter speed for a properly exposed image. When we take pictures of this ice cream, we'll want to use a smaller f-stop to make sure that the background is blurry so that the emphasis is on the subject, the ice cream. If we use a larger f-stop, the background will be in focus and the ice cream will lose emphasis. So let's take a few pictures of this ice cream to see just how depth of field and f-stops are connected. First, we'll take some pictures with everything in sharp focus. To do that, we'll set the camera to aperture priority mode and choose an aperture of f22. Now let's take some pictures with only the ice cream in focus. We're still in aperture priority mode and this time we'll choose an aperture of f3.5. When we see both images side by side, it shows what a difference the depth of field can make. The photo with the shallow depth of field, the blurry background, immediately draws attention to the ice cream while the photo with everything in focus has distractions in the background and can take away from the subject. As you're looking through the viewfinder, you may not be able to see the full impact of depth of field. When you change f-stops, they may all look very similar. It's a good idea to review the photographs after they've been taken to see the differences. Photographs taken with a large depth of field may have distractions in the background that lead the viewer's attention away from your intended subject. A shallow depth of field can minimize those distractions by making them blurry. The viewer won't pay attention to the blurry parts of the image, keeping the emphasis on the main subject. A shallow depth of field is useful for images where the background may be distracting, or places where the subject may blend in with the background. Photographers often use a shallow depth of field when they're taking close-up shots and when they're photographing people. A large depth of field is great for images where everything fits together and will not distract the viewer from the intended subject. Landscapes are a great example of this. In a landscape photo, all of the details are of interest and should be in focus. As the photographer, your job is to help the viewer immediately know what part of your image to look at, what the main subject is. By utilizing the proper aperture, you can ensure that the image is properly exposed and that the viewer gets the correct message from your photo. We're outdoors today and we'll be taking pictures of this windmill as we learn about shutter speed and how to use it effectively. We'll learn how to freeze the action of a moving subject and we'll also learn how to use motion blur intentionally to give the illusion of motion. The shutter is the mechanism that keeps the light from entering your camera until you're ready to take the picture.
Think of it like the shutters of a window on a house. It closes the window, or in this case the lens, and keeps the light out until you press the shutter release button. When the shutter release button is pressed, the shutter opens for a precise period of time, letting light into the camera to record the image. Remember, it's important to get the proper amount of light to enter your camera to get a properly exposed photo. The shutter can be set to stay open for a specific length of time to let the correct amount of light into the camera. The amount of time the shutter stays open when you press the shutter button is called the shutter speed. You can set your shutter speed to a very fast speed like 1 1,000th of a second or a very slow speed like 10 seconds or longer. The amount of time the shutter stays open will affect the exposure. When the shutter stays open longer, more light can enter the camera. When the shutter is open for less time, less light can get into the image sensor. The shutter speed combined with the aperture determine the exposure of each shot. It's important to have the correct combination of shutter speed and f-stop to allow just the right amount of light to enter the camera. If you use your camera's light meter, you'll ensure that you have the proper combination of shutter speed and f-stop to get a properly exposed photo. Sometimes the light meter's arrow will be on the left side of the meter. When this happens, the light meter is indicating that the image will be too bright or overexposed. To fix this, you can adjust the shutter speed to a faster setting, which will allow less light to enter the camera and make the image darker. When the light meter's arrow is to the right side of the meter, it's indicating that the image will be too dark or underexposed. To fix this, you can adjust the shutter speed to a slower setting to allow more light into the camera to make the image brighter. Shutter speeds are measured in seconds and fractions of seconds. They're indicated on your camera with numbers like these. The number 250 actually means 1 250th of a second, which is how long the shutter will stay open when you press the shutter button. The number 60 means 1 60th of a second. The number 2 means half of a second. And the number 1, with quotation marks, means that the shutter will be open for one full second. Keep in mind, when a shutter speed number is followed by quotation marks, it means that the number represents full seconds. For example, the number 2 with quotation marks means that the shutter will be open for two full seconds and not a half of a second. It's very important to know when your camera is set to full seconds and when it's set to fractions of a second. Digital cameras have two different modes that will allow you to change the shutter speed. One is manual mode and the other is shutter or time priority mode. In manual mode, you'll be responsible for making sure that both the aperture and the shutter speed are balanced to make a properly exposed image. In shutter or time priority mode, you will only need to choose the shutter speed and the camera will choose an appropriate aperture or f-stop for a properly exposed image. When photographing subjects that are moving, it is often preferred to use a fast shutter speed to freeze the action. Freezing the action makes it possible for the viewers to see the detail of the subject in motion. Sports photographers use fast shutter speeds to capture the moment at the peak of the action, which shows the detail of the subject in the midst of competition. To properly freeze action of something in motion, you should use shutter speeds of at least 1 250th of a second and up to 1 4,000th of a second. These shutter speeds will make the shutter open and close fast enough to capture the action. Sometimes slower shutter speeds are used to cause intentional blur. This can give the image the illusion of motion. Shutter speeds of 1 15th of a second or slower will leave the shutter open long enough to capture the motion of a moving subject while the shutter is open. The longer the shutter is left open, the more the subject will move across the image and the more blurry the photograph will be. The speed that the subject is moving will also determine how much blur is in the photo. There are two common ways of photographing moving subjects with slow shutter speeds. One of those methods is panning. When panning is used, the photographer tries to follow the subject with the camera as the subject is in motion. If done correctly, the subject will remain clear while the background is blurry. Another way to use slow shutter speeds is keeping the camera perfectly still while the subject is in motion. This will cause the background to stay clear while the subject appears blurry. This technique is often used when photographing flowing streams, fireworks, or streets at night. The stationary elements in the background will be in sharp focus, but the moving objects will be blurry. The longer the shutter is left open, the blurrier the subject will be. When you're taking pictures using a slow shutter speed, you should use a tripod to avoid unintentional movement of the camera, which will cause unwanted blur in your photo.
At slow shutter speeds, it's often difficult to hold the camera still enough to avoid a blurry photo. A helpful rule of thumb is to set your shutter speed to one over the focal length. Confusing? Let me explain. If the focal length of your lens is 300 millimeters, for example, you should set your shutter speed to at least 1 300th of a second. If the focal length is 50 millimeters, you might get by by using a shutter speed as slow as 1 60th of a second. If your shutter speed is slower than what is suggested, you'll want to use a tripod to minimize unintentional motion blur. Also, any time that the shutter speed is slower than 1 60th of a second, you'll want to use a tripod. Some photographers have more steady hands than others and can use slower shutter speeds without tripods. You may want to experiment with shutter speeds of 1 30th of a second or 1 15th of a second to see how steady your hand is before you try to use these shutter speeds without a tripod. Okay, now let's take some pictures of this windmill to see exactly how different shutter speeds can affect our photos. For the first photo, let's see if we can freeze the action of the windmill's blades in motion. To do this, we're going to set the camera to shutter or time priority mode and choose a shutter speed of 1 800th of a second. Now for the next photo, we'll try to give the viewer a feeling of motion. To do this, we'll make sure that the camera is still in shutter or time priority mode. We'll use a tripod and we'll choose a shutter speed of three full seconds. Varying your shutter speeds can help give a very different feel to photos of moving subjects. There are times when you'll want to see all the detail of the subject. These times call for faster shutter speeds. There are also times when you'll be willing to sacrifice some detail to give the feeling of motion and energy in your image. By choosing the right shutter speed, you can show the viewer the subject in the way you intended them to see it. In this segment, we'll be discussing exposure while taking pictures in various lighting situations. It's very important that the correct amount of light is allowed to enter your camera to record the image. Proper exposure is the most important thing you can do to make your photographs look better. One of the most important elements of exposure is ISO. We'll be taking pictures of this tricycle as we learn how ISO affects the exposure of your images. We'll take some pictures in the bright sun and some pictures in the shade. As we do this, we'll learn how the ISO should be changed as the lighting conditions change. The amount of light required to record the image is determined by your film speed, or ISO. Digital cameras still have the same concept as film speed. On your digital camera, ISO refers to the image sensor's sensitivity to light. Some ISO settings react very quickly to light and need very little exposure to capture the image. These ISOs are good for photographing indoors and in lower light situations. Other ISO settings are very slow to react to light and require more exposure to record the image. These ISOs are good for photographing outside in bright sunshine. You can set the sensitivity of your camera's image sensor with the ISO setting. The ISO can be set for a variety of situations and is measured in numbers like 100, 200, 400, 800, and 1600. The higher numbers will be more sensitive to light and require less exposure or light to get to the sensor. The lower numbers are less sensitive and require more light to get to the sensor for a proper exposure. With film cameras, we were stuck with a single ISO setting for the entire roll of film because the ISO is the speed of the film. You could not change your ISO setting in the middle of a roll if the lighting situation changed. With digital cameras, we can easily change the ISO setting with every shot with only a simple change in the camera. This allows the photographer more freedom to take pictures without the need to stay in similar lighting situations. You can freely move from bright sunlight to dimly lit situations, and with a quick adjustment to your ISO setting, you can keep taking well-exposed photos. Higher ISO numbers indicate a higher sensitivity to light. The image will be recorded much faster and needs less exposure.
This is great for photographing in areas with very little light like indoors or heavily shaded areas. You may wonder why we would ever use a lower ISO since higher ISOs provide more flexibility because they're more sensitive to light. The drawback to using higher ISO settings is that they introduce more digital noise into the image. Digital noise is how we describe the undesirable grainy appearance of a digital image. Noise or grain looks like tiny dots of random colors in an otherwise even area on the photo. Photographs taken with a high ISO setting will appear less sharp than those taken with a low ISO setting. It's important that images are as clear as possible. For this reason, you'll always want to use the lowest ISO setting you can, but still get proper exposure. Proper exposure is the most important thing to make your image quality as high as possible. Never underexpose an image because you didn't want to increase your ISO. A well-exposed image taken with a higher ISO will always look better than an underexposed image taken with a lower ISO setting. Lower ISO settings will produce a much higher quality image but require more light to record the image. Image quality is important, especially when you plan on enlarging your photographs. They may look clear on your camera's LCD screen, but when you make a print, you may realize that a photograph taken with a high ISO setting is more grainy than you thought. To keep your images as sharp as possible, you should use the lowest ISO possible. So how do you know which ISO to use? Well, here's a guide that can help you. It's also on your photography tips card, so it's okay if you don't remember all this right now. If you're shooting pictures outdoors in full sun, you'll want to set your camera to a fairly low ISO setting, between 1 and 200. You'll want to use ISO 400 if you're taking pictures outdoors in the shade or on a cloudy day. ISO 400 is also good for indoor photos with plenty of window light. And if you're shooting action pictures or pictures in poor lighting conditions, you'll want to use a very high ISO of about 800 to 1600. Now let's take a few pictures of this tricycle, and as you can see, we're outdoors in a very well-lit area. Since there's a lot of sunlight, we'll set the ISO to a very low number, 100. If we use this ISO setting, the image will retain its clarity and crisp detail, which will create more visual interest. Now let's take a few more pictures of this tricycle and as you can see we've moved to a heavily shaded area of the yard and there isn't as much sunlight. We'll need to change the ISO to a higher number to get a properly exposed image so let's set the ISO to 800. When we see both of the photos of the tricycle side by side, we can clearly see the difference in the clarity between the shots taken with ISO 100 and the shots taken with ISO 800. However, it's important to note that the shot of the tricycle in the shade would have been much too dark if the ISO had been a lower number. ISO aperture and shutter speed all work together to help you get proper exposure. The right combination of those three controls will ensure that you have maximum detail in your images every time you take a photograph. Make sure you always check your light meter with every shot you take. By checking your light meter and making the proper adjustments to your ISO, f-stop and shutter speed settings, you can have a well exposed shot every time. The best way to master these controls is to get out and photograph as much as possible. Take lots of photos and try making lots of adjustments to your settings. With digital cameras, you can learn these controls much more quickly because you can see your results immediately. Get out with your camera and have fun. The more photos you take, the better photographer you'll become. Thanks for watching Quick Pro's Exposure Basics DVD. We hope you've enjoyed learning more about shutter speed, ISO, and aperture in photography. We know this new information will give you enough confidence and know-how to take your photography skills to new levels. If you'd like to learn more about your camera, be sure to check out Quick Pro's camera guides for digital SLRs. Visit quickproguides.com to see our full line of instructional DVDs and camera-specific tutorials. Remember to use your exposure tips card to help you when you're out taking pictures and you can review any section of this DVD that is most helpful to you.